Want to have your own business but don't want to start from scratch? Franchising might be the answer you're looking for. Welcome to the Level Up with Nick Lopez show. The show that brings you thought leaders in business, franchising, and high-performance personal development. Whether you're a buyer, seller, franchisee, franchisor, or a consultant, find everything you need to know about franchising right here. Own a business without the pain and financial losses that come with creating it. Find the time, freedom, and financial independence you can have through entrepreneurship. Learn how franchising can help you get there. Listen up and get ready for another episode of The Level Up with Nick Lopez Show. Welcome to The Level Up Show with Nick Lopez, where we have the absolute pleasure of learning from thought leaders in franchising, business, and high-performance personal development. Uh, Today's guest goes without exception. Uh, He's an investor and advisor to franchisors. Uh, He's gone from franchisee to franchisor. Uh, He's definitely a podcaster. Uh, He's a mastermind founder. Uh, Franchise Secrets Facebook group, which uh, many folks in franchising know and love. Uh, He's a franchise mentor. uh, And we know him for the Franchise Tribe and Tribe of Investors. Uh, Mr. Eric Van Horn, welcome to the show. Mr. Nick Lopez, it's good to be here, man. Ah, love it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, ah, I think, you know, preparing for the show, yeah, I haven't had a guest on. I've had some pretty amazing guests, but I haven't had to reference notes when looking at a bio. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but today there's a long list of of items there uh, that you're involved with uh, in the franchise space, Eric. Uh, you're definitely an influencer. And uh, I most certainly appreciate all the things that you do in franchising. Um, You've been somebody that I've definitely admired. And um, like I said, appreciate all the things you do in franchising. So thanks for being on the show. You know, I hear so many people uh, talk about these unique ways of getting into franchising, but nobody really says, hey, I'm getting into franchising. So I'm curious, you're somebody that's um, pretty involved in a lot of different ways in franchising from franchisee to franchisor and really everything in between and around. Um, But I'm curious, Eric, uh, how did franchising find you? So I think I have so many things that I've done in franchising because I get bored doing the same thing over (laughs) and over. And I think I'll answer the question, how did franchising find me? And, and the answer to that, as you were talking, is I think why I've been able to do so many different things in franchising. Uh, so my first brand was called Liberty Tax Service. And, and I was able to buy Liberty Tax in my early 20s because I was planning to go to law school, didn't go to law school, started a lawn company, ended up uh, doing working on a house for a, a lady. She um, brought me some lemonade and said, hey, do you, what are you going to do when you grow up? I said, a real estate investor. I left that time with that lady uh, with a contract in hand to buy her house, no money down, just assuming her mortgage and my parents as business partners in that because I didn't have $5,000 for closing costs. And then a few months later, I sold my 50% to my parents for about $20,000, give or take. And I uh, was uh, involved or looking at Liberty Tax because some of my friends were looking at Liberty Tax. And I'm like, I have this cash, more cash than I've ever had in my entire life. I didn't want to blow it on anything stupid. So I bought a franchise. And and some of it was just luck uh, that I happened to do that. But as, as like I said, as you were saying that, I realized in my first year of owning Liberty Tax, I uh, opened up three locations right away. So I got experience as a multi-unit franchisee day number one. I got experience in partnerships, day number one. I got experience with out-of-state ownership that first tax season, day number one. And then I emailed uh, John Hewitt. I said, hey, I'd like to sell franchises uh, for you because I didn't have a job. And, And he's like, show up on this date. And there was a handful of us new franchise development uh, uh, folks that were uh, learning how to sell franchises. So like after my 
you know, six months in the business, I was now working at the corporate office. And then that allowed me opportunity to kind of see what was happening on the inside of the franchisor. And then uh, my parents and I bought the area development rights to Austin, Texas, uh, when they had four locations in Austin, and we ended up growing and selling that uh, about eight or nine years later, when we had 42 locations in that in that market. So area developer, franchise development, working for a franchise or multi-unit franchisee, that just gave me, you know, a lot of insight into the franchising world that the average single unit franchisee doesn't get. So I, I first time I thought about that, Nick, like, you know, I, I think that's why that's how franchising found me. And I think that's why I've been able to go and do so many different things within franchising. Hmm. So you start off as a franchise owner and, uh, you know, stewarded those resources really well, right? Turned that 5k into 20k, um, and, uh, you know, invested that wisely into, um, you know, Liberty tax. And so you start off as a franchise owner and then you work for corporate doing franchise development. And then did I hear there, you were doing an area development role. You took some locations and then we okay. bought the area development. So at that time it was called, yeah, area development, which is today people know that is most of the time people know there's a master franchising model, but we bought the area development, what, what it was called. Now it's called area rep. And so basically we bought Austin, which had just call it 60 territories that were undeveloped. And my role as a 20 something year old was to sell franchises and to help those franchisees, new franchisees become uh, successful. And the more successful they became, the more money that I made and the more that they would, that they would grow and expand in that market and the more valuable that that market became. So it's kind of like a mini franchisor, but without all the, uh, the, the responsibility that becoming a real franchisor is like. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So you did hear that correctly. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and that was in Austin. So yeah, that clearly gave uh, a, a foundation beyond just a single unit franchise owner, as you mentioned. Um, so, you know, fast forward here a little bit. I appreciate you going back there and laying some of the groundwork. Um, but, you know, what are you doing these days? So, um, sold sold that. I bought, uh, like, I was a franchisee with six other brands, an area developer with two or three other brands. Uh, sold pretty much all of that. Um, I live on a ranch out here in the middle of nowhere in the Black Hills in South Dakota with my wife, and we have three daughters, eight, 10, and 12. This is a fantastic life. Like I love this, uh, the, the chill life out here in South Dakota, and I got used to having businesses out of state. So like currently what I do is I advise franchise brands. So I have franchise ors that want me to advise them. And I'll typically take a piece of equity for that. I have masterminds where I help franchisees get better and be around other amazing franchisees and bring in really cool speakers. And then I have a franchise or mastermind where like some of these young franchise ors, like, like they don't know what they don't know. And I'm able to kind of shortcut the process for them and just give them really good, smart people like you, man, you were in there helping these emerging brands and, and knowing, knowing what pitfalls they might be getting ready to experience. And so they can avoid them. So like having people like you in there with your knowledge and experience, just helping some of them. And then I do a lot of in passive investing. I love passive investing because I don't need to be the richest guy in the world. I don't need to have the biggest business. I want to have the most epic lifestyle. I want to be known as a guy that my family loves being around me. I want my kids to know me and to love me and my wife to do the same. And so that's more important to me than money. So I, um, so I've kind of, you know, I'd rather just instead of building massive businesses these days more, I would rather passively invest my money. So I have a lot of passive uh, income coming in that exceeds my lifestyle expenses. So it pays my bills, but exceeds my lifestyle expenses. And I help other people do the same in the tribe of investor mastermind. Um, and then I'm doing different things with, you know, with front street, as you know, with, uh, with some friends doing some different stuff with franchise or as advisory and helping them in different ways. So Franchising stuff, franchise or stuff, investing stuff. That's what I'm up to. Yeah. So I, I definitely know the team, uh, some of the team there with 
with Front Street. Um, so what are some of the projects you guys are working on? Uh, what, what are some of the things you can talk about? One of them, we've never talked about this uh, publicly yet. So uh, this is fun, man. Talk about <laughs> it on the Level Up uh, podcast with you. Uh, it's called Magnolia Soap and Body is one of the brands. We have some others in, in the works right now, but it's like soap, soap stuff, like natural soap and it's experiential. And, you know, she had a, a brand that has like about 20 locations and she has um, locations that she's had herself for years and they do really well. And so when we look at a brand like that, that the founder is successful and the founder wants franchisees to be successful. It's like, and we know that we can help them because there's other brands that we can't help that other people can't help, but we know that we can have a significant impact on their brand, which means franchisees will get value out of it. We want to help brands like that. So Magnolia is one of those. Sometimes they go into the broker networks and sometimes it's better for organic, but um, you know, like, as you, we want to provide some guardrails for some of these brands and just help them like get in the trenches. We call it strategic advisory, but it's really in the trenches. And you've had some mentors like that, that, that have been in the trenches with you. And I'm sure you're, you can, you could be that guy in the trenches with other brands, but there's so many um, things that brands do wrong early on that, that have a significant impact on, on the franchisees and the brand value and the way the brand's able to do it, you know, once they have 10 or 20 or 50 or a hundred franchise locations. So we want to, we want to help them grow faster than they could on their own while avoiding so many different mistakes and Magnolia soap and, uh, and bath is one of those brands. Um, and branding is important. Like, you know, about that, like we know some of the most amazing branding people out there. And like, we want to bring in somebody like Gary to be like, hey, <clears throat> get your mind on this brand, get your genius on this brand, and let's make sure that that it's buttoned up from a branding standpoint. Because once you get that branding set up the right way, you, you know, that's the foundation of your brand from a marketing standpoint and so many brand story and so many different things. And, you know, you and I both know and, and love Gary, and he's one of the best out there with that. Mm, yeah, Gary, the Oracle. Ah, <clears throat> oh, he's amazing. He's <laughs> yeah, amazing. absolutely. Yeah, he's uh, sat as our uh, chief marketing officer and uh, yeah, helped us with that uh, process. And uh, yeah, I was actually working with some of the leadership at Front Street um, in their previous endeavor uh, with St. Gregory. And and Gary was so instrumental in, in so many of the national brands that St. Gregory took to market. And, and we were so fortunate to be in that position. And that relationship carried forward with Gary. And, it, you know, he's acquired that nickname of the Oracle just because of his Oracle-ness when yep. it comes to brand development. Um, so yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. You don't want to take uh, this local footprint that has been successful with, uh, you know, the founder of a brand and, uh, you know, there's probably some gaps. You don't want to take those gaps and scale them because those gaps just compound. And so, uh, yeah. Okay. So front street, you're, you're partnering with um, founders and concepts that are clearly successful in their market and have a lot of potential to bring value across the country to many clients, but you're bringing that franchise leadership experience and uh, helping level up uh, different elements of the business uh, prior to scaling it. What what a fun process. It's just one of the many things that you're doing. Um, yeah, we actually had uh, met up in at a springboard in Philly and you shared with me a little bit about Front Street. And um, yeah, I, I uh, have a lot of respect and, and admiration for Jeff and a lot, a lot of his talents for doing just that. So I was curious where his next endeavor was going. And so knowing that he is partnered with you, um, my goodness, what a, and I know some of the other partners as well, what, what a um, impactful group of in, individuals. And yeah, those founders that are working with you guys are definitely in a pretty awesome position. So through all of your experience, Eric, um, you know, different projects and all throughout franchising, but what do you think are some of the lessons 
that you've learned, right? I'm sure you're constantly learning lessons that take you into your next projects. And, and uh, as we all know, we don't want to repeat the same mistakes. And that's a part of leveling up. And I think that's something that you have clearly been really good at. So I was curious, you know, what are some of those lessons that have helped you to level up? Uh, that you would share with our audience? Dude, I have so many going through my mind and just trying to figure out which ones to share. Hmm. From a franchisee standpoint, uh, going from brand to brand as you are a franchisee, and I've been that, I got overconfident in my own ability to, to be successful because I was successful in this brand and I went on to be successful in multiple brands. And then I had one that I was not successful in and, and realizing most were not successful in that brand. I realize in franchising, so many people say, if you're not successful, it's your fault, not the brand's fault, but sometimes it's the brand's fault. And, mm -hmm. and, and it was my fault for thinking I could overcome some of the weaknesses that I, that I saw because I was successful. Um, so realizing early emerging brands carry more risk. And so I started to think about, uh, uh, the lesson that I learned if I would go into other brands as a franchisee, if I was to do that, and I am actually doing that right now, um, as an investor, but I want to ensure that that brand, the, the franchisees that I invest in are proven operators, like they've proved they're proven franchisees in that particular brand and the brand has a proven track record of success, not their item 19, but a proven track record of success. I mean, you can call up the franchisees and actually validate with them numbers, KPIs, gross, uh, you know, customers, all this kind of stuff that you want to understand to make a good decision in a business. If you, if you have to rely just on the item 19, it might be the most amazing business, but it is a higher risk. And there's risk reward with everything. Early brands, you get to uh, have a pick, pick of territory, like the whole country is wide open, but you're franchisee number one. So it's high, high risk. And most of them uh, don't make it. And that's just, the, that's just the reality. So in terms of, you know, just thinking, I want to get another franchise. I want to be a franchisee. I think risk mitigation and just really getting honest with myself or people that I advise, like get honest what you, what the real risks are. And there are risks with brands like that. Even if the founders have been successful in another brand, that eliminates some risk, but that's not full risk mitigation. Um, and I've, and I've seen that play out where they were successful in another brand. They started a, a new brand not nearly as successful, or maybe there's a couple of them that are successful. And then, um, and then they have, you know, they go on to really scale multiple brands and there is a, they're not all that successful. And there's some losers in there. So just getting um, honest with myself with stuff like that. So how do you mitigate risk with that? One of the things I think about is looking at uh, industry, you know, like the painting industry, like I, if I'm looking at a lime, I'm thinking, you know, Nick's proven. He's a proven franchisor because he's done it. Franchisees are proven uh, because I can call them up and they haven't just been in business for six months or 12 months and they've been through a pandemic. So like, I like all of that about uh, models that are more proven. And then I think just validating the industry in general, like what is the painting industry like? What is the remodeling industry like? And what's it, why have more, uh, more services to offer versus just like just painting porches or just painting front doors or just painting the inside or the exterior? So I would validate industry to make sure that, um, that what I am being led to believe is actually true. So especially with models that are in new industries or industries that are not really proven, I would start to try to go figure out like, is what I'm being led to believe actually true? Research out of the franchising industry to find that out because some of these brands within franchising, um, uh, some of their, some things might be overinflated and underinflated. 
And, uh, and that's just reality. And you know that. And that's why I appreciate you and what you've done, because, you know, it's hard, it's hard to find people that are trustworthy and people that have done it and been in your shoes. And, and I, and I think you're both of those. Hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. So, you know, it sounds like the lesson, I didn't expect you to go there. Um, you know, clearly from a franchise owner standpoint, um, it, it's not always what it seems and it's important to do your due diligence. And even though the, let's say the founder and even, even the item 19 looks great. Um, but you definitely want to have more conversations with the folks that are doing it. Um, even if a founder has been successful in the past and this is their second, third, fourth brand, well, not every oper- not every franchise system is going to be a home run. And so truly figuring out, okay, how are the franchise owners doing, right? And, and so it sounds like validation is just so important when it comes to understanding, okay, is this an opportunity that's going to give me everything that I hope and expect? Yeah, um, yeah so if well, I were to... If, Yeah, go ahead. So to piggyback on that with validation, like what you just said. So I was a franchisee with Solo Salon Studios. We grew that to 12 locations in Orange County. We had an eight-figure exit on that. Back to the first three locations that we opened up. The first one, we we, and we basically secured leases on three locations and we opened them up within like nine months of each other. Location number one, average location, opened up as we expected it to. Location number two, everybody thought, we as, as owners thought, franchisees thought, the founders thought, corporate staff thought that was going to be the best location in Orange County. It turned out to be the worst location out of 12 locations that we had. Like it lost money. It would just continue to lose money. We had to lower our rents. We had to do so many different things. And it took a lot of our time and attention. It was a dog. It was our dog. Um, third location, we thought, oh, we just we just opened this one up in Huntington Beach and it was a dog. Now we have this other one that we're opening up in Irvine and it is the most expensive lease that we have, the biggest build out, all of this. And we opened up making money from day number one. Like we opened mm-hmm. up our doors, making money. We couldn't do anything as franchisees to, to stop making money in that one. We had a hard time trying to make money in location number two. We couldn't stop making money in location number one. And we had levers to pull. I mean, in location number three, we had levers to pull in location number one. So takeaway there, lessons learned is, you know, location matters in a, especially a retail concept, but service space, it does as well from a customer, custom, who your customer is and whatnot. But from a franchisee, same franchisee, we were same management team, same marketing, same everything, different location, three different outcomes. Um, so if you were to validate with me at location number one, I'd be like, yeah, this is, you know, it's what we thought we're making some money. It's not amazing. It's good. It's what we thought. If you were to validate with me on location number two, I'd be like, this brand sucks. This is the worst brand. We thought we were going to be making money. We're losing money. We're doing everything that they say. We're not making any money. It was more expensive than we thought. They thought it was going to be great. They're not telling us the truth. You know, that's would have been validation. Validation uh, on location number three would have been, hey, these fran- this is the best franchise in the world. Like we opened up, we started making money. We're making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. And like, we can't screw this up. So we love the franchise or we love the training team. They didn't even think this location was going to be that great. Now it's amazing. So this is the best brand in the world. If, if we were single unit operators of location one, two, and three, you would have heard three completely different stories based on our experience. And they were all true. We went on to continue to open up 12 of them and we sold the private equity. And that location number two was the worst one. We eventually made money in it, Nick. But that just shows you like just because... Like location matters. Brand was the same. Franchise was the same. Everything else was the same, but location really matters. So territory, like a lot of brands, and there's another like dirty little truth in franchise. And I'm glad you let me go here. I love, I love it. But look, territory matters. Like the, 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 the type of territory that you end up buying actually plays a role or the location that you end up uh, opening in plays a role in, in your success as a, as a franchisee. So some takeaways with that is like um, the franchisor is right. A lot of times on that, they're not always right, 
And just because, you know, we thought this one location was going to be not very good and it turned out to be great. So I'm glad that we decided to go all in and, and not just, um, you know, hang our hat on one location or two locations because we probably wouldn't have been able to have the exit that we eventually had. So there's some, uh, there's another lesson that I learned as a franchisee. Yeah, it's a huge benefit in, in, in owning multiple territories versus just a single. I mean, that third unit that you mentioned, everyone was kind of like, eh, but it actually ended up turning out to be pretty solid. Um, and so those odds, and, and I, you know, as you were talking, you know, I was having that thought not too long ago, uh, just the, the, the power behind a territory, but yet the unknown, right? Yep. Um, when we launched Boise, Idaho, it was a, our first territory out of state and, and we're a high-end paint company. So, you know, you wouldn't necessarily say Boise, Idaho is a high-end paint company, but it has consistently been a top location and it's grow, It's a growing market, but, you know, our threshold for awarding that territory was half a million dollars. And, and so we look at home value as that threshold per market. And in Boise, it was half a mil up. In Denver, it's a mil. In LA, it's two million. And so we're awarding territories in those top third of home values within that market. But even then, you know, there's there's some of that ambiguity around um, just what nobody knows. And uh, and so yeah, having multiple territories helps to mitigate some of that and and uh, reduce some of that risk that can be there. Um, you know, I was also thinking about on the franchisor side. You, know, you have some franchise candidates where, you know, they <clears throat> don't necessarily stack up as having all the intangibles or hard skills that we think are going to be a home run in the business, but yet they are a great culture fit and they are very adamant that they want to be an owner. And so we award the territory and, uh, you know, generally we have a decision day and there's a handful of groups there. And so you know, it's not necessarily totally focused on one individual. So, you know, most of the time awarding multiple uh, licenses to multiple groups in a period. And, and so, you know, you don't necessarily, um, you, you know, think overthink about, yeah, I don't know, this individual may not be a great fit or a great performer. And then all of a sudden they're just making all this noise. They're crushing it, hitting it out of the park in you know, if we were that selective in not allowing them to join the franchise, um, I think we'd miss out on that opportunity. So there's a little bit of that unknown all around that, um, you know, it, it uh, definitely has to play itself out. But, you know, I want to transition a little bit, Eric. Uh, we talked a little bit about some lessons, but from your experience, what makes a, and we're talking around this a little bit, but what makes a franchise model successful? What are some themes? A fran what makes a franchise model at the franchise or level successful for, for, that makes a franchise or successful for franchisees to be successful is I think um, a franchise or one that has proven the model out in an average market or at least they're honest about with themselves about the market. Um, and so they're actually making money uh, according to what the item 19 says in a particular market within a particular like geographical area. So number one, like the model actually works and they know why it works. It's not just, it happened to work or, you know, they know why. Um, and then I think the leadership team in the, in the franchise or um, it, it makes a big difference. I, I, just because somebody was successful as a, as a mom and pop business owner, doesn't mean they're going to be a successful franchise or even if their business what is or was successful, like you all of a sudden go from a successful mom and pop business owner or just big business owner, whatever you want to call it. And now you're a franchise or the different problems, different business. And, 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 and you don't know what you don't know. That's just the truth. You don't know what you don't know, unless you have strategic advisors, you seek out mentors and all the things that like, you're one of the few guys that really did a lot of that. Like you really did it, but most people don't. So I like early merging brands that 
have really smart people with franchise and experience on their team or as advisors. Um, so that, and then they are just kind of honest with where they are. You know, we're new. This is, this is where we are. We're not the most amazing brand yet, but we're going to get there. So I just think honesty and transparency is really important um, in the, in that as well. Um, so those are kind of two, two big things, you know, proven track record in the, in doing the thing that they are telling everyone that they can do successfully. And then they have the industry experience and the franchise and experience as advisors or on their team. I think that's really important. Hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's been my, uh, you know, naturally I'm a perfectionist and, and, uh, I'm also pretty humble. I, I try to be pretty humble. I have no problem saying I don't know what I don't know. And uh, being a perfectionist, I'm like, I definitely don't know franchising. So it's been important for me. I should say I didn't know franchising when I got into it. Um, and it's so it's been important for me to really put in that due diligence. And, you know, going back to my degree, I seen the sales uh, process that I learned translate and produce results. That wasn't me, you know, having the humility to recognize that and, um, so I wanted to go out and surround myself in franchising with folks that, um, you know, know a lot more than me and, and could help me, uh, with some of that upfront infrastructure that ultimately, uh, allows for supporting growth and doesn't do the opposite, expose gaps in that growth. Um, not to say that things are perfect, but to then have that, ad those advisors and that leadership team to, to help pivot and adjust and, and uh, close gaps as growth happens. Uh, so pivotal. So yeah, franchise model, what makes it successful is, uh, is a great leadership team an experienced leadership team, some humility there to admit that, Hey, we don't have it all figured out. Um, I think franchise ownership, business owners in general, you know, I, I've been harping on this more and more as of late. I think the best entrepreneurs are very, very humble um, whether it's humble acknowledging that you did something wrong with a client or that you can get better serving a client, customers, the community, the product, the business, uh, it, you know, in order to compete and stay relevant and deliver value, you have to have humility to level up. And uh, if you don't have the ability to do it in house, seeking those and being coachable uh, to level up, and and so as an as a franchise owner. That's the beautiful thing in the in the franchise model is you have the the resources, the tools, the support uh, to give you that playbook and and get you through those uh, learning curves that ultimately level you up to uh, have a successful business. So, Eric, that's a little bit of my opinion toward what makes a successful franchise owner or I love entrepreneur the in general. Aspect of that, Nick, I love because like. And you've got to ask questions. You've got to be curious. Uh, one of the brands that I was a founder of and helped start as a franchise or first training, we did a survey right after training. What did we do well? What can we improve on? And we got a list of things that we could improve on. And we said, we're going to take, you know, not all of them, but some of these. And we're like, we are improving on this for our next training. We let everyone know, we heard you. This is what we are changing for our second training. And we did it and we got a better response. You always got to improve. And if you think you know everything as a franchise or you're that's that's mistake number one and you're going to always be a run the business as a dictator you have to ha listen to franchisees and you have to be willing to tweak and change things because they're the ones out there on the ground going through your training doing the thing they they are the eyes and the ears on the ground so you got to listen to them and yet be the franchisor and still stay the course and give direction so it's a balance mm. but i love what you're saying with humility and i couldn't agree more Hmm. So in your opinion, what do you think are some elements that make for a successful franchise owner? I think as a franchise owner, the, the, sec the most successful that I've seen hang out with other successful owners and they're always wanting to improve and they're just doing more of what works. And it sounds so simple. What do you mean do more of what works? Like if, if, if a certain market, if certain marketing is working, do more of it until there's diminishing returns. If you need to knock on more doors, send more flyers, make more phone calls, spend more money on this, like do more of that thing until, like I said, there's diminishing returns. So I learned that early on. Like I used to think like, oh, 
these franchise owners are more successful because they have a better territory or they have a better market or whatever the better thing is. And then I realized, wow, as I got to know them, as I got to see what they're actually doing, they're doing three times or four times what I'm doing. So no wonder they're getting three or four times the results that I'm getting They're, You know, so I just, I, and then they all hang out with each other. If you think about it, a lot of these top franchisees hang out with each other. And that's why I started the franchisee mastermind to Cause I, then I started to go from brand to brand. I, I went from Liberty tax and I went to some different brands and I, re, and I got to know top franchisees in other brands. And I'm like, wow, they all kind of have the same problems, same issues. The there's reasons why they're all at the top, uh, top of their game. And they were all multi-brand units like I was at the time. And so we all learned from each other. I learned from people in the massage industry, how I could impact the current businesses that I was in or the eyelash industry or the senior care industry. So I just started to learn from a lot of different successful franchisees in different brands. So I just think having that heart and that desire to learn and to be open and to, and to share and give as well makes a successful, will help you become a successful franchisee. Yeah, doing two to three times, four times the amount of effort and uh, doing the right effort. So, you know, as a franchise owner, you may be doing, you know, a fourth, a third of the effort, and it may not even be the right behavior. Um, so, you know, not only uh, the amount of effort, but uh, the right effort. Absolutely. I, and I love that about uh, just I always say there's this law in existence and you know it's much like physics cause and effect but in the business realm it's behavior equals outcome and uh the great thing is you can control that effort you can control that behavior unless one thing it's the wrong behavior but um yeah hanging around with franchise owners it's going to give you a good feel for um you know what to do at what capacity uh, my gosh, I can talk to you about this stuff. So there's a right way and wrong way to do that. Here's like, like with behavior. So you get, you are, there's two ways to approach it. You see a successful owner and they're doing successful things. And let's just say they are doing a hundred things of whatever it is. They're doing a hundred business to business deliveries. And so you as a franchise owner, a bad franchise owner will go in there and be like, oh, I'm doing a hundred as well. If you're going in there as a franchise owner, that's wanting to level up, you say, okay, they're doing a hundred, but what are they doing that's different than my hundred to get different results that they're getting? The results, the outcome, the outputs are different than mine. So what are they doing different? And then you start to say like, oh, they're not delivering moldy donuts or they are going in and they're getting access this way or they're doing this thing or they're getting coupons in or they're able to talk to this person. So like find out what the successful people are doing that's different than you. You go in with that question versus confirmation bias of saying, oh, they're doing a hundred. I'm doing a hundred. This, they just must be luckier than I am. And how much of that is doing the, the business model, right? How much of that is the, the behavior of those top performers being the basics and whatever way, like in our case, the Lime way, right? From your experience, are those owners doing innovative things that are leading to that or innovative behavior or I'm sure there's some innovative elements, but uh, some are like so in franchising uh, may not be true in Lyme. It true in a lot of ones. The top franchisees are usually doing all the basics, right? Like the Lyme way, they're doing that right. But a lot of them are innovating and they're doing different things, but they've almost earned the right to do that because they've done the basics well, and then they are improving on the basics. And some of the stuff that they're improving on might turn out to be a really good thing. And some of it's a waste of time and energy. So like, I like to learn from those guys and be like, what are you doing? How are you doing it? Why are you doing it? And, and is it, can I duplicate that? If they're just testing things out, I don't want to spend, I don't want to spend time on it unless I'm at the point in the business where I'm so successful, I can start testing things out as well. Sometimes the franchisors, don't like that. Sometimes they do like it. And sometimes they just, you know, they just let some of these top performers just do what they want to do because they're not hurting the brand at all. And they come up with really good ideas. And once that brand top franchisee comes and says, Hey, Nick, I got a really good idea. It's working. And this is why it's working. Nick's like, Oh, let's roll that out. And that's how some of these brands get better. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Well said. Oh my gosh. I think the key word there was they earned, um, that, that, uh, leverage to, uh, um, go out and innovate because there's trust in the execution and there's rhythms for understanding what makes the business model successful. And, and, uh, there, there's trust in, and, uh, in that innovation, uh, because you have to be pushing the envelope to get more results, right? You kind of hit that ceiling and uh, every market's a little different, yeah. um, but not different enough to where the business isn't uh, what makes the core of the business work. Um, not different enough to get away from the core of the business, but um, clearly it's a changing, evolving uh, landscape there uh, from a competitive and just commerce standpoint. And so innovation is absolutely necessary. And uh, that that trust and communication there between top performing, middle performing, heck, even bottom performing franchise owners and uh, the franchise themselves, that's what levels up a brand and takes it to the next level, most certainly. But, you know, Eric, I want to transition here. Um, I feel like I could talk to you all day. I know we're running here uh, a little bit uh, towards the end of our, our show, but um, I am curious. I want to get your thoughts on, you know, where is the industry going? Are you noticing some trends in, in the franchise industry as a whole? Uh, what are some of your observations? So just like kind of big picture, just spitballing some. I see VC starting to make more investments in early stage brands, which is interesting. We see VC in a lot of other 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 industries and to see VC come in, venture capital come into franchising is fun to see. I see um, just in general, uh, franchise sales organizations. You have, to, as a franchisor, like you just, 20 years ago, you could have a mediocre sales team, franchise development team, and just get leads online, franchise buyers online, and or the phone book or the yellow page, whatever it was, and they would come. But things are so different now. Early brands, emerging brands, unless they're like a crumble cookie that had an amazing unicorn success, uh, they don't, they don't, they need to have some talent, uh, like with a franchise sales organization, it comes at a cost. So that's where franchisors need to be well capitalized. If they want to grow, um, in a, you have to grow at some type of speed or else it's really hard to get traction. Um, so I, franchise sales organizations, and I'm sure that that's going to get inno it more innovative, um, as, uh, as we go into the next 10 years, I think, uh, uh, organic content, um, viral content, uh, Instagrammable type, uh, type brands will be interesting where there's more influencers coming in and saying, I'm a part of this brand or customers just had an amazing experience. And it goes out on on uh, on Instagram or maybe a big influencer like Kim Kardashian gets a hold of it and says, I just had this amazing experience here, blah, blah, blah. So, or maybe local influencers get, get some of that. So that's free press, free content, free exposure um, from somebody that organically found you because your brand is cool and it's Instagrammable um, or TikTokable. I don't even know that that's a word. I don't think it is, but you know, something I think that will become uh, more important or not important. They'll just be unique. I think, I think there'll be some brands with that. I think um, experiential, like we've heard experiential for a while in different brands, but like cu the customers that can really have an experience with some of these brands versus just get a product or a service. Um, I think that's going to be more of a trend. Um, family of brands, some, some there's groups that are, that are uh, larger organizations that have families of brands there'll probably be more of that probably early uh, franchisors exiting earlier stage to have a, a liquidity event, meaning they sell their, their brand and probably still have the, there's on as a CEO or as a thought leader or something with that particular brand, but now they have access to more capital. They got a, they got liquidity. And now this other uh, group has more capital to be able to inject in the brand to help the brand grow. So those are just, you know, off the top of my head, uh, some of the things that I see as, uh, you know, uh, things happening in the next number of years in franchising. Hmm. Uh, so many cutting edge things that you, you mentioned there. Uh, I definitely want to have you back on. I think we can talk about just those innovative elements 
uh, in, in a whole show itself. But uh, franchising is definitely flourishing and it has been trending that way for, uh, what would you say, Eric, about a decade now? Yeah. Um, and uh, it looks like it's, it's, it's only um, continuing. And clearly the franchise model is a phenomenal way to get into business ownership, uh, accomplish the American dream, but deliver this unique value prop in the market to clients uh, across the country. And that's really what it's about. Combination of those things, bringing value uh, to customers, to business owners. Uh, that's the, biz- the beauty of the franchise model. And uh, it- it's individuals like Eric that are helping level up the industry and making it better. So Eric, as I mentioned, thanks for everything that you do in franchising. Uh, it's been an honor to uh, be on your show and get to know you. Um, Eric, if anybody is interested in reaching out to you uh, for any of the things that you do, um, how can they get in touch with you? Probably the best way is Scalable Franchise, scalablefranchise.com, or check out the Franchise Secrets podcast. Nick's been on there. Um, or check out the Franchise Secrets Facebook group. Just go to franchisesecretsgroup.com. Uh, or Tribe of Investors. That's my passive investing mastermind, tribeofinvestors.com. But really just go to Scalable Franchise. That's probably the best way to uh, to get connected with me and find me on social. But Nick, man, it's been fun. I appreciate you, what you bring to the franchising world. I know a lot of people look up to you. You've been the person that's been mentored by people. Now you're a mentor to many out there. And your humble approach to franchising is a breath of fresh air to people like me. And knowing how you care about your franchisees, you care about helping them grow their businesses. That is sad to say, but unique out there in the franchising marketplace. So I just appreciate how you have a heart to give. You've given to my community in so many ways. So thank you for letting me come on your show. Uh, It's been fun. Uh, And hopefully... Uh, you have watched this and leveled up in different ways. Um, please uh, click the subscribe. Uh, that's how we grow and can do just this: give back uh, to franchising, share knowledge with thought leaders um, in franchising business, high performance, uh, personal development, uh, individuals just like Eric. But more importantly, please drop a comment down below. Contribute to this very dynamic conversation. Um, I'm I'm definitely interested in hearing some of your thoughts. And as always, level up. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Level Up with Nick Lopez show. Remember, it's never too late to get started on your entrepreneurial journey. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share if you enjoyed today's segment. Catch us again next week and visit limepainting.com For more of the Level Up with Nick Lopez show.